Welcome, Investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hello, everybody. It's Jared, your host with All Things Crime. Welcome to another episode. You know, this morning, I'm just excited to have another lawyer on. And I know that's one of those areas that's part of the entire investigative and judicial process that we don't really uh, explore much. And so uh, we have the amazing opportunity this morning to hear from an appellate attorney. So I'm going to have Elizabeth explain the whole appellate process in just a second, but want to introduce her. Her name is Elizabeth Franklin Best. She has what's called a boutique law firm in Mm -hmm. South Carolina, and she specializes in appeals. So Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. And so let's get right into it. First of all, if you could just explain, you know, who you are and how you came to have a boutique uh, law firm and, and kind of a, l- a little bit about your career and, and how you chose this route. Okay, sure. Yeah. So Elizabeth Franklin Best is the name of our law firm. We are kind of a smaller law firm right now. We handle criminal appeals. We handle them for state defendants, primarily federal defendants these days. And so we do the direct appeals once somebody's been convicted after a trial. And then we also do post-conviction matters for federal defendants, what are called like 2255 motions. We handle compassionate release petitions. We do federal habeas for state defendants who are trying to challenge their convictions in federal court. So pretty much like after somebody has been convicted and they are trying to unwind their conviction, that's when we get involved. So I started this firm about three years ago. Prior to that, I was doing death penalty work for about eight years here in South Carolina and also in Mississippi. and really sort of learned a lot about, you know, kind of complicated, complex litigation. You know, death penalty cases are often incredibly complicated. So, you know, I feel like in our firm, we take a lot of sort of the techniques that we learned, a lot of sort of the principles that we learned in capital defense, and really sort of apply that to guys who are not serving death sentences, but who are serving significant sentences, but who want some creative and aggressive challenges to their convictions. So that's pretty much what we do. We're in the Southeast. We're expanding our reach. We have done a really good job of kind of partnering up with local council and other parts of the country to really try to expand our reach and and to help guys sort of throughout the country. So that's what we're doing now. I mean, I started off as a public defender, kind of quickly went into appellate law, and that's what I focused on for about the last 16 years. So that's just kind of, you know, my little place. There's some people who are really great trial dogs. That's not me. (laughs) You know, I'm I'm one of the lawyers who just kind of does my best work when I've got like a nice little panel of judges in front of me. You know, I've got my computer, I can write, and that's just my little corner of the criminal justice space. So I saw on your blog or or your website that Mm -hmm. you can do appeals in pretty much any appellate court, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what's kind of nice about the federal system is that, you know, once you're licensed and, you know, sort of the top court in your home jurisdiction, it's really not very difficult to get admitted into other like circuit courts of appeal. You know, to, ber- to represent somebody at the district court level, we usually have to enter what's called, you know, pro hack viche, where we get like local counsel to assist us. But, you know, criminal defense attorneys are kind of like a I mean, we're sort of like a tribe, right? And so it's not very difficult to find other lawyers throughout the country who are willing to help you help a client. And so we've just had a lot of success with that. And it's been not nearly as challenging as I kind of thought it would be when I started thinking about expanding our reach. Oh, interesting. So I, I think it'd be really interesting for the audience to kind of get your explanation of exactly how the court process works, and especially once it gets into the actual appeals process. So let's take, and you said you were a capital defense attorney, correct? Did you ever work on the prosecution side? Never. 
No, I have, I've always been a criminal defense lawyer. I mean, even from the time I was in law school, my first externship was at the Wyoming Public Defender's Office, and I've just never really looked back. I've just okay. always been really comfortable on, on this side of it, frankly. So any particular reason why that would be more appealing to you? No, I don't really know. I mean, it's something I kind of ask myself because, you know, I, and I'm, all I can really say is that from the time that I first started doing criminal defense, it just kind of fit like a glove. You know, I just found myself kind of on to helping people who didn't have much of a voice. You know, I think when I was young, I always kind of instinctively really disliked bullies. And so it's always been kind of easy for me to kind of get in a courtroom and bow up on, you know, on behalf of somebody else and, you know, challenge the government. You know, I've got kind of a pretty big sort of libertarian streak in me. And that idea of just kind of challenging, you know, the more powerful entity, the government has always been something that's been kind of attractive to me. So, you know, it's challenging. I mean, I think it's challenging being a prosecutor, too. I think that being a criminal defense attorney, sort of fortunate in the sense that, like, you know, I never feel like I'm on the wrong side of a case. You know, I feel like I'm never wrong so long as I'm kind of fighting for somebody to have a voice in the system. Whereas prosecutors, you know, I think have to spend a lot more time, like, wondering if they've got the right person, if they've investigated the case as well as they should have. You know, I, I can see it being a prosecutor, perhaps as maybe being a little more stressful in some respects when it comes to those sorts of things. But I mean, so long as I can just sort of do the best that I can and give a client my best advocacy, you know, I sleep very well at night. Okay. So I had an attorney from the San Diego area who worked on the defense side. And it, I, I thought it was so interesting the way he described how he views his responsibilities as a defense attorney. And he was basically saying, you know, my job isn't necessarily to get my client off. My job is to make sure that the prosecutor and the judge are both doing their jobs. And if yeah. they're doing their jobs correctly and there's enough mm -hmm. evidence to support it, then naturally my client will be found guilty. And that's, you know, he said, my, my job is to make sure that they're doing their job. I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, that's just a great way of putting it because I agree with that completely. You know, I, I don't believe that any criminal defense attorney gets anyone off on a technicality, right? I mean, what people may call a technicality is really someone's due process rights. You know, I mean, the, the criminal defense attorneys are steps into the courtroom with the, the goal of protecting someone's constitutional rights. And so long as we're putting up the fight to do that, then, I mean, what happens in the courtroom is justice, um, and sure, I mean, they're, you know, the guilty people are going to get convicted, but our job is to make sure that even guilty people receive the best that our process has to offer them, the best that the system can provide. And it just, you know, it keeps the system strong when you make, you know, robust challenges to it. Yeah, I think the whole process of our judicial system is, I, I don't know, I, I mean, there's parts of it, certainly, that are unique, but... I think the entire, the, the way that it's all set up, and again, we, we still need to explore how the, you know, the whole appeals process works, but I think just the way that it's set up in order to protect the individual citizen is so important and it's so unique that your right to a robust defense, especially in light of, it's usually the, the government, which oftentimes has unlimited resources to throw at a case and as an individual citizen, most of us don't. So how is it that, you know, we can actually defend ourselves against such a, a, a massive entity? Well, the way you do that is, number one, the prosecution has to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. On the defense, you're automatically assumed innocent until proven guilty. So from the lawyer side of it, explain to me how you view those particular things. I mean, you're right. So the government 
often has unlimited resources that they can bring to bear in any particular case. And I mean, that's true, the state system also, but I mean, especially in the federal system, I mean, it's just enormous things that they can kind of bring to bear against a particular defendant. And to be a criminal defense attorney in that space really, I think, requires a certain amount of kind of aggressiveness and also creativity. Sometimes, you know, the best trial lawyers are always like a little scrappy, you know, (laughs) the ones who are just going to like walk in and are willing to kind of pick a fight. But the creativity is one way that I think that criminal defendants, criminal defense lawyers can help to kind of level the field. And, you know, I'm a member of several sort of organizations, but one of them is National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And so, you know, we have meetings, you know, throughout the year, and it's always a really great opportunity to meet with other interesting criminal defense attorneys throughout the country who who are really good at things. I mean, there's, there's a lot of brainstorming that kind of goes on among you know, again, kind of members of the tribe, the criminal defense tribe, as ways of kind of challenging particular aspects of of what's going on. Like, for example, you know, just recently, the United States Supreme Court issued its opinion in New York State Pistol and Rifle Association versus Bruin. And so this is a case that really has kind of changed the way government regulations of firearms are to be analyzed in in the court system. Well, now there's, you know, there's like a, a group of defense attorneys who are kind of working together to create some challenges to some of these convictions and some of these prosecutions based on firearm ownership. And it's kind of interesting just to sort of watch it happen in real time. I mean, you know, the opinion came out in June and by July, there's like this core of lawyers who are focused on this issue and who are providing information and ideas to one another as we're beginning to raise those challenges throughout the country. You know, and at some point, the United States Supreme Court is going to have to respond to some of these challenges that are now making their way through the court system. So, you know, that's the kind of, you know, out of the box sort of thinking as a way of, you know, kind of promoting the interests of our clients. So that's, again, kind of another way that we try to advocate on behalf of our clients, even though the government has extraordinary amounts of resources. So that's kind of my answer to that. I mean, you wanted to know a little bit about kind of how the appellate process works. And, you know, I think that's a really great question because I will tell you, I have this conversation with clients all the time and everyone sort of grew up watching Law and Order, a lot of kind of crime television. And so people have a very good idea about what a trial is and you know, they know what Miranda warnings are. They know a lot of this sort of front end, I think of it as front end kind of criminal defense work. But then when somebody's convicted, it's a little surprising. I mean, people just are like, you know, now what? Now what do I do? And there's actually this whole sort of universe of possible legal remedies that people can take advantage of at that point. But people have to be knowledgeable about it. So when somebody's convicted after a trial, the first thing they get to do is a direct appeal. And you have every state provides for that. Okay, And it's just an opportunity to kind of correct an error. Sometimes you call it like error correction kind of process. And this is when you get to file a direct appeal where you can make claims about legal errors, you know, problems with what the court did, for example. And legal errors. And typically, it just needs to be sort of apparent on the face of the transcript. So that's your first remedy. And everyone gets that as a matter of right. Now, after you lose that, things kind of change a little bit. You then have, for most states, what's called like post-conviction relief. Sometimes it's called like state habeas. And it's an opportunity to do what's called like a collateral challenge to your conviction. And so, you're... I'm sorry to interrupt, Elizabeth, but habeas... Explain what habeas means. So state habeas and federal habeas, those are two different things. This is getting kind of like in the weeds, kind of wonkiness. But habeas is a way of challenging the government's kind of like physical possession of your body. You know, I mean, that's where the writ of habeas corpus comes from. It's like, you know, show the body. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge to your conviction. In a state habeas or a federal or a post-conviction action, Typically, what it will do is it'll allow you to bring in kind of new evidence in your case. 
So let's just say that your lawyer, your trial lawyer, failed to call your alibi witnesses. So in a state habeas proceeding, you might be able to bring that person to come and testify. And you're going to ask the court to grant you a new trial based on it. If you lose that, then you have the opportunity to, you know, appeal that to the court. So you have kind of the second round of appeals. If you're a state inmate and you lose that, then you have a right, the ability to go into federal habeas. And so that's a little bit different than a state habeas. But federal habeas, you're essentially asking the federal court to take a look at what the state court has done with your case. It is a really high burden. You have to show that essentially there's been a complete breakdown and kind of like the whole adversarial process. I mean, right now, especially with the Supreme Court that we have right now, highly deferential to state court convictions. They are not going to overturn state court convictions unless there has just been some, I mean, I don't even know what the standard would be anymore, but it is exceedingly hard to win in federal habeas these days. If you're a federal inmate, you have the opportunity to do what are called like 2255 motions, where you, again, can make allegations of ineffective assistance of trial counsel, ineffective assistance of appellate counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, Brady claims, anything that's not really apparent from like the actual transcript, anything that you need a new evidence to bring to bear on that. And then, of course, tough tough to make the the showing. I mean, it can be really difficult to reverse convictions at this point. I mean, for sure. But it's also an area where I think this. I'm sorry. As as you're talking, I yeah, sorry. I'm as you're talking, I'm just kind of like, well, you know, how how bad would a defense team have to screw up in order to get an overturn based on that? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, it's not easy, right? I mean, the the further out from a conviction, the more the state has an interest in, like, the finality of that conviction. So, I mean, your best chances of reversing your conviction are going to be at the direct appeal stage. If you're in post-conviction or in federal habeas, the interest in finality is much higher, and courts are much more, you know, exacting and in, in sort of the standards that they apply and obtaining relief. Is that is that mostly because of the seriousness of the cases? I mean, it, most of the time, if you're actually charged with federal felonies, for example, then those are, at least in my mind, those are typically going to be a little more harsh and a little more like the crime itself has to be worse if you're going to get charged with federal charges versus yeah. state charges. So does that come into play? I mean, it's fine. Somewhat. I mean, so I I agree. I mean, oftentimes we think of federal charges as being more serious than state charges. But at the same time, when you see murder cases, those are typically state cases, you know? So, I mean, it's federal interest. Oftentimes you're dealing with, you know, cases that impact larger groups of people, right? So you'll have like large drug distribution rings. And so the federal interest there is that they don't want this large harm. So, but I mean, as for why it gets more difficult at each stage, it really is just kind of the structure of our criminal justice system. You know, we want to give a convicted defendant an opportunity to have somebody look at the case to make sure it's a righteous conviction. So that's kind of what the direct appeal is historically, right? I mean, it's this one shot where you make your best case to show that there was a very significant legal error in your case. After that, though, I mean, the courts are like, look, you had that shot, you know, (laughs) you had your opportunity to prove that this was not a good conviction. So we're going to make it a little bit harder now. Like you can show us that there's like an error in your case, but you're also going to have to show that you were significantly impacted by that and that your trial did not function as it was supposed to. So it's it's a higher burden even when you get to that post-conviction or that state habeas stage. Then by the time you're in federal habeas... So the way that kind of all came about was when Timothy McVeigh blew up the federal building and killed a bunch of people in Oklahoma City. So after that, Congress passed what's called the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act, so EDPA. And EDPA really kind of changed the landscape of federal habeas. I mean, it used to be that an inmate could file a federal habeas petition and it could just be heard at any particular point. After EDPA was passed, it's given inmates one year 
from the time that a conviction becomes final in order to even ask the federal courts to get involved in that case. And one year means one year. I mean, you miss that deadline by a single day and you are out of court. It is, you know, but you better pay attention to that statute of limitations. But not only that, it also brought into play a particular provision called 2254, which means that in order for a court to reverse a conviction, it has to find not only that the state court adjudication in your case was wrong, but that it was unreasonable. And so all the time you'll see, oh, you know, the the court kind of got the case law wrong and this isn't accurate. And sure, there's a legal problem here. But the federal courts are like, wrong isn't enough. (laughs) It's not enough. It has to have been unreasonable. And that is a really high standard. And, you know, when you read kind of the case law about this, I mean, what the courts are saying is that, look, I mean, we're going to leave criminal convictions, state convictions to the state courts. And the federal government is not in the business of getting into state court adjudications. And we're not going to unless we think there is just this huge malfunction in what's happened below. And in that case, we might, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so that's kind of the, the playing field that you're in after somebody's been convicted. I mean, I can understand why there aren't any television shows about, you know, sexy appellate lawyers. Cause I mean, it's just really kind of wonky stuff. Not really nearly as fascinating as trial drama. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.